Hey, what's up guys? My name is Erupt and welcome back to another Destiny video and in today's video we are going to be doing another lore video and this consists of both a bit of Toland and a bit of the bad juju mixed together and explains a bit more about the journey or conversations before the Hellmouth where Eris Morn first went to fight Crota. So I do hope you enjoyed this video but the first part may be long, it does get a bit more interesting towards the end and explains a bit more about the bad juju but the first part I will talk about Toland so I hope you stick around for this this is going to be quite a long video this should take a while but it will be interesting i promise with destiny moving so slowly i thought i'd chuck some more videos in here now because i actually have time to do them i've been wanting to do them for ages and i've just never had the time so i do hope you stick around and enjoy this lore video so without further ado let's take a look at the start so it says, there are many legendary warlocks that have walked the halls of the tower, but very few have ever been banished. Tolan the Shattered, however, was. Why? Because the type of knowledge Tolan specialised in, he was obsessed with the darkness and the hive. Let's take a look at a piece of Tolan's diary. I drive myself to the edge of manners, trying to explain the truth. It's so simple, elegant like a knife point. It explains, this is not hyperbole. This is the farthest thing from exaggeration. Everything. But you lay it out and they stare at you like you've just been exhaling dust. Maybe they're missing some underlying scaffold of truth. Maybe they're all propped on a bed of lies that must be burned away. Why does anything exist? No, 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 no. Don't reach for that word. There's no reason. That's teleology, and teleology will stitch your eyelids shut. Why do we have atoms? Because atomic matter is more stable than the primordial broth. Atoms defeat the broth. That was the first war. There were two ways to be, and one of them won. And everything that came next was made of atoms. Atoms made stars, stars made galaxy, worlds simmered down to rock and acid, and in those smoking primal seas, the first living molecule learned to copy itself. All of this happened by one law, the blind law which exists without mind or meaning. It's the simple law to know and has no worshippers here. Out there, out there. How do I explain it? It's so simple, why don't you see it? Imagine three great nations under three great queens. First queen writes a great book of law and her rule is just. The second queen builds a high tower and her people climb it to see the stars. The third queen raises an army and conquers everything. The future belongs to one of those queens. Her rule is harshest and her people are unhappy, but she rules. This explains everything, understand? This is why the universe is the way it is and not some other way. Existence is a game everything plays and some strategies are winners. The ability to exist to shape existence, to remake it so that your descendants, molecules or stars or people or ideas will flourish and others will find no ground to grow. He goes on to talk about how the most ruthless things or the ruthless beings or the most destructive rulers are the, always the people that come out on top. So this is what it says next. Let me break it down for you. What Tolan is talking about is known as ontology, which is the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. What he is speaking about is nat natural selection, sort of a survival of the fittest. He believes that there will be a battle of three major groups in the near future. One designed by nature to be powerful, one structured by people to have order, and each of the three with armies. But because nature, that which is unrelenting, will win. So he studied the darkness, Toland obsessed over the power of the Traveller and the secrets of the darkness. His quest took him into enemy strongholds throughout the inner solar system. The weapon that Toland took with him on his travels was a vanguard rifle known as Shadow's Prize. That is until the knowledge he accumulated was deemed too dangerous and was banished. His journal, however, was something that many other warlocks sought after. One of the things within them with the plans of the weapon known as the bad juju. Even after you acquire the parts to assemble from Zer, you still need the light of conflict to fill the frame. Once you're done, you're left with a pulse rifle as dark energy seeping from it. This explains why there's a big eerie glow of hive darkness shredding around the air. If you believe your weapon wants to murder all of existence, then so it will. There must be a structured mechanical explanation for this weapon's hunger for combat. There must be, but none has been found. Ariana 3, one of the guardians that went on the first moon battle to fight Crota with Aerius Morn and Toland and three other guardians, she says this. This. In our world, Crota seemed invincible. Together, Eris Morn and I worked the problem, but found no hope. So we sought forbidden knowledge. The exiled master of Hive Arcana, we found Toland. So Toland is basically the guy that created the blueprints to the Bad Juju. That's what's going on right now. Toland created the blueprints to Bad Juju, and Ariana 3 and Eris Morn try and remake the gun to get Toland back. So she's talking now about Crow. Toland tells us that Crow's presence in our world is a shadow, that his true power resides in a netherworld, forged by his will. We must pass through a keyhole between realities, navigate the seething midnight of Crow's world mind, and overthrow the ascendant champions that gather to his throne. Toland speaks, he hardly seems mad at times of the terrible things that await us, a secret song he hungers to learn, and the issue of that song, an ashen burning star husk that looms above the utter antithesis of life. He talks of it with a curious ambition I do not want to understand. 
Well, Tony tries to explain his obsession to Ariana 3, just so she understands a bit more about why he's so obsessed with it. Ariana, let's sing. Sing with me. No, no. You're rattling the machine. Not yet. It's too soon. We don't know the words. We'll learn the song down there. We can learn it from her. She comes up from the deep, dark places where the greater hive awaits to sing it to us. And here's a puzzle for you. So uh, what I believe he's talking about at the minute is because we're a bit, bit more deep into the lore and storyline of Destiny as I'm saying this, because this was probably wrote before the taking King came out, I believe he's talking about Iranuk and the other Death Singers, so they're the people that kind of, their daughters to Crow. These are two of the strongest Hive Wizards there are. He goes on to say more about the Death Singers. To hear it is to die, to know the words is mortal. Oh, good point. Ariana, death is just the word, isn't it? A catch-all term for the failure to go on. Nothing spiritual, nothing with all its own quiddity. We all die once, and it did not prove insurmountable. But what if, what if, listen, what if death were refined, described in its totality, made autonomous and universal, separate from any context or condition? What if she could invoke the ending of anything? How then would she know the song and sing it without herself dying? Perhaps they know a way to make themselves part of the song, part of something vast and burning that rots and peels into ash, but never ever ends. Perhaps she has engineered this for him, and pinned his power up against the quiddity of her death itself. I am so terribly curious to know. Eris had said the Shattered once referred to Crota as the God-holding domain in a threshold between our world and theirs, so what that means is there's basically a world in between our world and the Hive world. He said he could decipher the means by which the Hive called to him. From all that I've seen, I know he was right. Tolan then gave Ares the reasoning behind why the Hive liked to use swords. So after this long conversation of Tolan telling the whole group about why he's so obsessed with the Hive, and he wants to learn the death song, and they finally create the bad juju. Eris finally forms her team to go down to the Hellmouth with Toland as they guide, but one by one, they obviously fell, as I do explain it in my Eris Morn lore video. So Toland uses Emerald Light to conceal Eris. Eris, they'll believe you are one of their own, and that is the only way. Tolan's knowledge of Hive is the reason Eris was able to survive. Eris, of course, returned to the tower with her knowledge, and that's how she survives, obviously, in her own lore story. Then you guys go on in the Dark Below DLC to go and kill Crota for her, and Toland is never seen after that, and that's why I believe he will come back in a future DLC to something more to do with the Hive. I believe the Hive are going to be another major part in another DLC, not just the Taken King, but maybe something after that. But guys, I do hope you enjoyed this lore video. I don't do them very often, but they will be a coming thing. Tell me if you like them, and tell me if you want to hear more about the Hive. If you're a hardcore Destiny fan, tell me what race you want to hear more about, or any guns that particularly capture your attention. So guys, I do hope you've enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, share this on social media for more Destiny tips, tricks, news, and updates in the community. My name's been Erupt, and have a great day.